And so, Amy, are you going to switch me over as the host? There you are. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning again, everyone. Can 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 everyone hear me? Okay. All right. Um, let me let me do this. Can y'all see that? I'm going to periodically reduce it. Okay, I'm going to try to work back and forth just uh, some slides to make it a little easier. But I, I really did want to um, uh, make this available to church uh, because it's hard to get together right now. And this would be a way to uh, give us a, an excuse to do that and talk with uh, Amy and Darren about what uh, I might do, what they would prefer. And we just decided we'd start with a, a basic overview of the New Testament. And if uh, some people like this and find that it um, uh, sort of whets their appetite for more, we'll, we'll perhaps try, uh, try this again in the near future and get a little more in depth with some things. This is gonna be very much a, um, an overview. <laughs> We're not gonna get in uh, deep on, on the New Testament, but um, we sent out uh, the course outline or Amy did for me. And that's the schedule that um, I have planned out. But you know, it, it's always okay to modify that if we uh, get into one session and uh, there are more questions and interest about staying there. We can always uh, modify on on the fly here. Okay. So maybe one of the things I just want to encourage you um, after one of these sessions, uh, if uh, you think about it and have some other things that you wish we could have done that we didn't do or more of something, just email me and uh, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll try to work that in, all right? Um, so again, feel free to unmute yourself and ask me a question uh, at any point or if you prefer to ask a question by typing it in the chat. Okay, so let me, let's see now. Now, do y'all y'all see that picture of uh, Augustus Caesar? No. Oh, I got I got to share it. That's right. There we go. You see that now? Yes. All right. All right. Now I'm going to try to enlarge this, and sometimes when I do this, I can't see the folks on the. Uh, there we go. All right. So uh, when we think about the New Testament, we, we want to start by reminding ourselves that uh, the movement we think of as uh, early Christianity uh, gets started in the Mediterranean world, particularly uh, uh, a period in time dominated by the Roman Empire, although we, we always have to remind ourselves that there, there were some uh, Christ communities uh, that were a little bit further east, out here beyond the uh, Roman Empire. Um, but that's uh, a topic for another, another uh, day. So most of you know the basics. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Books is sometimes a a bit generous term for you know things like uh, the letter of Jude, which is just you know about a page long. Um, but within that, we've got several different genres. Uh, obviously, four gospels, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, one Apocalypse. That's the Book of Revelation, and twenty-one letters. Uh, some of you might have heard the word epistles. Epistle is just the uh, another word for letter. Basically, it's a uh, from the Greek for, for letter. Uh, we've got to remember that what, what we know as the New Testament was originally handwritten in Greek. Uh, this is long before the printing press was invented. Uh, this is a little fragment of Mark's gospel. 
one of the earliest fragments we've got. Um, some want to date it as early as 150, some date it later to 250, so I split it down the middle uh, and said circa 200. Um, but uh, really before the, uh, the 300s, we don't have complete copies uh, of, of uh, anything. But once we get to the 300s, uh, we've got a, a few, very few, complete or nearly complete copies like this. This is uh, uh, something called Codex Vaticanus, was discovered, as you might guess, in the Vatican uh, in the 19th century. It had been there for no one knows how long, <laughs> but it uh, came to light in the 19th century. And uh, I don't know if you can see it, but down at the very bottom here, it says, according to Luke. And then of course, right here is the beginning of John. That's, that's how they did it then. The, the uh, title would come at the end. Any questions so far? How, how, do you, would you, how would you like to read that? There are no spaces between words. It'd give you a real headache. <laughs> and, and we got to remember, very few people could read and write. We're talking probably less than 10% of the total population. So our, our New Testament documents were written roughly between 50 and 150. Some, like Paul's letters, we, we can date reasonably well. Others are educated guesses. Um, and we all, always have to remember that uh, there were other documents that uh, Christ followers uh, produced in this period. Um, We've got someone trying to come in. Let me let her in. Uh, we've got to remember that uh, there were a lot of other documents that were eventually produced, but the 27 we call the New Testament eventually gained canonical status. And we'll, we'll uh, talk more about what that involves uh, as we go along here. But uh, these 27 became the, the, the standard bearer for uh, the Christian movement. here. So let me talk a little bit about genre because um, sometimes uh, it's helpful to know what kind of document we've got. Uh, the closest thing to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John's documents is Greco-Roman biography in Greek this was called a bios, uh, in Latin, a vita. Uh, vita. Uh, some, some of you, uh, particularly in uh, the uh, academic field, might have a curriculum vita. It's kind of like a, uh, an academic resume. Um, and we know that these uh, uh, ancient biographies were usually produced by people who wanted to praise in some rare cases, condemn a subject, but they, they, they were not what we would think of as uh, disinterested uh, journalistic accounts. Um, I, I think that if a, uh, a, a well-educated uh, uh, Greek were to come across, say, Mark or Matthew's gospel and read it, they would, they would think that it was uh, a biography as they would know it, but with this somewhat odd or unusual Jewish content. And I think the thing that would really surprise them is the subject, this guy, Jesus of Nazareth. Because one of the things that um, we, we tend to forget, uh, for us, Jesus is the biggest deal, right? And we can't imagine a time when he wasn't considered an extremely important personage in human history. But really in his lifetime and probably for the next 200 years, 
even though this movement or in his name is um, uh, growing, the vast majority of people in the Roman Empire had never heard of him and wouldn't have expected to hear anything about him because he did not fit the type that one usually dedicated a biography to. He's not a king, a general. Uh, he's, he's a little more like a philosopher, a teacher, but he's not um, uh, your typical, uh, he's, he's not like an Aristotle, let's say, or Plato. Uh, so he was, he was uh, an odd choice, uh, most uh, who came across his story would conclude like, you know, why would you write about this guy? And one thing we'll talk more about it uh, next week. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we we get the term gospel applied to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John because Mark's gospel begins in the opening line, the beginning of the good news, Evangelion, about Jesus the Anointed. Um, we, Paul talks about the good news in his letters, but he's not talking about a biography like Matthew or Mark. Uh, he's talking about the message about Jesus the anointed, uh, which is, uh, uh, from Paul's perspective, extremely good news. We, would, we might even paraphrase it as world transforming news. And we'll, we'll do more with this uh, uh, next week, but this term good news, or what I'm translating good news, comes out of Roman imperial propaganda. The emperor, uh, uh, the, the good news was that uh, uh, the gods had sent Augustus Caesar to uh, create peace and prosperity. More about that later. Um, briefly, the book of Acts was uh, volume two of Luke's gospel. This is the first little bit of, of this. I uh, just translated enough to see the connection. Um, the author clearly uh, connects this with uh, the, the third gospel, what we know as Luke's. Uh, it, it corresponds to ancient history, but again, kind of like um, a biography, uh, ancient history is uh, a bit different from modern history. Uh, one of my really good friends from the University of Indianapolis is a European historian. Um, and his idea of how to write a proper history would be very different from, from the ancients. Uh, gi give you one example, probably uh, one of the earliest and best historians in the ancient world is a Greek writer named Thucydides. Um, and Thucydides lived uh, several hundred years before Christ. And he was involved in the Peloponnesian Wars. These wars just devastated the Greek city-states. It left, uh, it left um, Athens and Sparta uh, shells of themselves. Um, he, he, uh, Thucydides tried to figure out, you know, what had happened and how this war had become so devastating. And in his kind of preface, as he's setting things up, he, he explains that where he's describing scenes and conversations where he himself was personally present, he's tried his best to, uh, capture what people said, admitting that, you know, this is not a word for word account. He, he, he doesn't have that kind of memory, but he, he, he uh, says it's uh, as best as I can recall. But then he says, where I've described conversations involving people in situations where I wasn't present, I've composed speeches that are appropriate to the occasion. What did he just tell us? He made it up. <laughs> so we've got to always be a little careful about you know, how we use ancient history. But uh, anyway, Luke, Luke's uh, uh, book of Acts has had enormous influence because we've got four gospels, but we've only got one 
uh, uh, Acts of the Apostles. And so that's become the sort of definitive narrative of the first generation of the church, even though we know a lot of other things were happening that for whatever reason, Luke never got around to addressing. Any questions so far? Well, uh, w when we come to the letters, we'll, we'll look at uh, uh, a, a couple of actual ancient letters. Uh, they're, they're all over the place. Um, hang on just a minute. I've got someone in the waiting room with just a number and no name. Amy, I don't, I don't feel comfortable. Ask them, ask them to identify themselves. And if they don't, um, then don't let them in. Okay. Sorry, folks. All right. <laughs> uh, I see all the all the chatter now. <laughs> I've not heard from I've not heard from the person in the waiting room. The other thing is, Perry, if you want to go ahead and make me host again, I can manage that and you can just keep teaching. Okay, let me try to do that now. Hang on just a second here. So, nope. Ah, here we go. All right, Amy. There you go. All right. Sorry, folks. Now, let me. Share my screen again. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so going back to letters, uh, we've got literally hundreds, if not thousands of examples because um, in, in uh, Hellenistic Egypt, a lot of papers, papyrus, just got tossed into the trash. That example of Mark's gospel uh, that I began with uh, is one such example. And there are still these um, graduate assistants working in uh, various uh, museums, mainly Britain, trying to uh, catalog and identify these, these things. But uh, they've, they've, we've got hundreds of letters just pulled out of the trash. And we, we do want to remind ourselves that these letters were, were just that occasional pieces. Um, Paul didn't come, come home at night, you know, after uh, arguing with uh, the, the Corinthians, let's say, and say, ah, oh, my publisher wants another book of the Bible tonight. You know, he's, uh, he's writing letters to uh, communities that he's intimately involved with because they've got questions, they've got issues, and he's trying to help them from long distance. So that's just a, a reminder of the occasional nature of these. And when we come to uh, the book of Revelation, we'll do a lot more with this, but uh, the, the the translation, the book of Revelation, is a, tr is a translation of this Greek word, apokalypsis, or apocalypse. And so the word means literally an unveiling or an uncovering, hence a revelation. And so uh, it begins the revelation of Jesus, the anointed one, which God gave uh, to him to show to his servants. And then 
uh, the author who identifies himself as a fellow named John uh, proceeds to uh, uh, reveal what was shown to him. Um, we might, I, I think the, the closest thing, and this is by no means an exact analogy, uh, uh, ancient apocalypses are, are very unusual to our modern sensibilities. But I guess the closest we might think of them is something like fantasy literature today. Uh, and I don't mean to be frivolous with that. Uh, certain kinds of fantasy literature, uh, think of um, uh, Tolkien, for example, uh, deal with uh, very serious uh, uh, human themes. And uh, I think apocalypses are similar in that respect. There are uh, various apocalyptic sections and other parts of the New Testament. We can maybe say a little bit more about some of this when we get into some of these particulars. So for example, in Mark 13, uh, as Jesus and the disciples uh, have come out of the temple and Jesus has predicted that the temple is going to be uh, uh, destroyed, one of the disciples says, tell us when these things shall be and what is that sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. And according to Mark, Jesus then launches into a description of all of these uh, events that will happen as we get closer to uh, what, what today we tend to think of as the end of the world. That's not quite how they would think of it. They, they were thinking of it as the end of the present age as we know it, hopefully to be replaced by something better. But until then, there would be a lot of uh, uh, turmoil. And uh, in Paul's, uh, another example would be chapter four in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, which uh, many people, myself included, think is our earliest New Testament document written almost surely in about the year 50. Um, and we'll do a little more later, but uh, Paul uh, is writing to a community that has just come through some kind of period of uh, severe harassment, persecution. We don't know all the details, but it got so bad that Paul had to leave for his own safety. And so he wrote this letter to them uh, because he, he received word that uh, um, despite uh, the difficulties, they were, they were standing very uh, steadfast in their faith. But then he, he, he raises this, I don't want you to be uninformed brothers concerning those who have, and I've added recently died in order that you might not grieve as do others who have no hope. And, and he's talking about apparently uh, some members of this little uh, Christ community who died in, in the persecution. We don't know how many, it might have only been a couple. But uh, it gives Paul an opportunity to talk about his understanding of the end of the present age and its replacement with something new and better. And this is where our, our idea of the return of Jesus uh, scholars call it <clears throat> the parousia in Greek, because that's the word that Paul uses. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so whenever you see a document like 1 Thessalonians 4 or Mark 13, talking about events that will lead us up to the end of the age, that's, that is termed uh, an apocalyptic uh, section. So, Again, a reminder that uh, the people who produced our 27 documents didn't know they were writing the New Testament. Um, they were writing, you know, for their communities, um, like Paul's letters. Uh, we, we know not with great specificity, but we, we know in general that some communities had certain documents, but not everything. Um, like um, Matthew's gospel might have been all that was known in some communities, Luke perhaps in another. It would have been early on a rare community that had all four or more than these four. Um, but um, we, we know that it was this uh, 
value that these communities placed in these documents that caused them to be uh, copied. You know, that's, that's critical. If people don't find something useful, it's not going to get recopied. And uh, eventually it'll just disappear from the record. Um, we know that by about the year 100, there's a collection of Paul's letters in circulation. We think uh, a collection of 10 letters, uh, as best we can tell, um, the so-called pastoral letters, first and second Timothy and Titus were not a part of this earlier, uh, early collection. Um, and we know that by you know, the early 100s, a number of gospels had been written and they're all out there in different places. But the first time that someone claims that there should only be four that we take seriously and gives them names, uh, mentions them by name, is uh, this guy here, uh, uh, Irenaeus. Now, of course, that's exactly what he looked like. Of course, we don't know. We have no idea what he looks like. <laughs> but notice the date. That's 185. Um, and so uh, uh, he's kind of our first indication that the four we know are uh, gaining, shall we say, a certain kind of status in at least some communities, certain, certainly the communities that Irenaeus is writing for uh, um, are, have, have uh, um, come to regard these four at, at, with greater value than others. Um, by about the year 150, so this is, you know, a, a, about the time that, that Irenaeus is alive, and he's a good example. Uh, there's one group of Christians who call themselves orthodox, little o, and that word orthodox means straight thinking, basically, right, correct opinion. Um, and they, not surprisingly, tended to prefer documents that uh, they considered to be uh, orthodox in, in their theology and in their instruction. Um, so you begin to, to see some sort of theological sorting out. Uh, there are some documents that you might have used before, but now maybe someone has questioned whether they are straightforward enough in their theology. So you might you might uh, not use that. By the uh, 200s, there appear to have been some list of quote unquote approved books uh, or, or uh, uh, yeah, uh, approved books. Um, uh, so that we got one we, uh, from Rome that uh, dating it's really hard, but it could be as, uh, early as say 200. And much of what we would recognize as the New Testament is there, uh, but it's got other things uh, that it considers important. For example, um, this, this one list mentions uh, something called the Shepherd of Hermas. And very few Christians today would have ever heard of it. And yet, in some parts of the early Christian world, if you were sort of placing bets on what might make it into the New Testament, Shepherd of Hermas would have been a good bet. But as we all know, it, it eventually kind of lost its place, not so much because uh, its theology was um, a question, but uh, it, it, uh, it was extremely long and uh, it was thought, it was known that it was probably not written by a first or even a second generation Christian. And so it, 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 it came to be regarded as just a little too late, though once upon a time it was still considered quite uh, important. By the early 300s, most of our New Testament documents are uh, in place, uh, though some were still being debated. But the, the, the takeaway here should be that what we call our New Testament, and that's a, a obviously a very old edition, Hekaine Diatheke, the New Testament, 
um, it represents documents favored by these early Orthodox Christians. Today, of course, is uh, the Eastern Orthodox Christians uh, uh, Easter. So um, some of you, we, we might have a chance to talk a little bit the last week about some of these other documents that it didn't survive. Some of you have perhaps heard of the, um, the Gnostic Gospels. Those represent uh, documents by Christian groups that thought a bit differently. Um, so, in, in interpreting the books of the Bible, or what, what we, we call scripture, you know, uh, things that are now gaining authority, uh, or this is a very simplified uh, picture, but I think it'll, it'll serve us <clears throat> for, for now. For early Christian interpreters, there were two basic levels of meaning in a text, the literal and the spiritual. And sometimes the literal was not that flashy, right? Um, and so how do you unlock the spiritual meaning? Well, there are two related tools that these early interpreters tended to prefer allegory and typology. Um, and here's, here's an example. This is a, another image of an early Christian named Origen, one of the most brilliant men of uh, the ancient world. He was uh, uh, an Egyptian Christian uh, and philosopher. Um, you see, see, he lived until the middle of uh, the 200s. Uh, not everything he wrote has survived, but, but a lot has. And to give you an example, he wrote a commentary on the book of Numbers. And if you took a look at uh, chapter 33 of the book of Numbers uh, uh, in advance of this, it's just a, an itinerary. Israel has uh, left Mount Sinai and now here's uh, point A to point B to point C on their way to uh, the promised land. And it's just, you know, Israel went from X to Y camp there. It's a pretty boring, uh, tedious account. That's the literal sense. What, you know, and so Origen said, uh, there's a spiritual meaning here. And so he, he, he notes that they start out from the Egyptian uh, city of Ramses. That's where they, they leave Egypt. And he turns this into an allegory of the journey of the soul towards salvation. I'm not going to read it all for you, uh, but it goes on in this vein for quite some time. So what, what looks like a, just a boring list of places where the Israelites camped, he turns it into a theological treatise about uh, what the soul must be able to accomplish in order to uh, achieve uh, salvation. There are even some uh, examples of, of the use of allegory in the New Testament itself. So um, in chapter four of Mark's gospel, <clears throat> we've got uh, the, the little parable of the sower. The sower uh, throws the uh, seed around and some of it falls amongst uh, uh, thorns, some of it falls in thin soil and doesn't grow, some of it is eaten by the birds, etc. but some of it does find its way into the appropriate soil and produces a really good harvest. And a little later in chapter four, Jesus, uh, according to Mark, explains this and turns the different kinds of uh, seeds into different kinds of hearers. So, for example, uh, the, the seed that uh, falls amongst thorns represents people that hear the preaching of the good news and receive it, but then the cares of the world strangle that faith like weeds. So you see it becomes something different from the original parable. And uh, Paul in his letter to the Galatians, uh, refer, he's, he's um, trying to persuade uh, the Galatian followers not to follow a version of the gospel different from what Paul taught them. 
and and he reminds them of the story of Hagar and Sarah. Does, doesn't even use their names, but, but, but uh, refers to them. Some of you might remember, Sarah was the, the wife of Abraham. Hagar, whoops, I'm sorry. Uh, ha uh, Hagar was uh, the, the surrogate wife, the second wife. Uh, and uh, Hagar had a son before Sarah was able to. But once Sarah eventually had a son, poor Hagar gets banished. And Paul uh, comes explicitly out and says, now this story is meant allegorically. And says that the story of Hagar represents uh, um, uh, a, a, uh, a version of the gospel that would enslave you. Whereas the uh, Sarah version of the story represents a version of the gospel that uh, is freedom. So he turns the stories into uh, something that serves his, his uh, needs at the moment. Typology, we'll see this a little bit when, uh, well, not a little bit, but uh, more when we come to the letter to the Hebrews, where something from the Old Testament is a kind of model or a prototype for Jesus or something in the early Christian experience. Um, check my time here. Oh, we're, we're doing good. So Barry, think of, can I ask a question before please. we go on? Sure. It sounds like allegorical interpretation is basically symbolic interpretation of the text. That would be a fair so, way to put it. Okay. Yeah. That, and I'll, I, Maybe I'll come back to this uh, in the if we've got time at the end. Um, it, it's it's a fair question to ask. When Jesus told parables, did he did he uh, intend for them to be understood as allegories? I don't think so. <laughs> but uh, that's something we can talk about. Do you have a follow up there, Liz? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So, so think about, you know, by, by the, by the, uh, 300s, the, the, uh, 325 and, and later the the church is legal. All right. And, um, it's it, at least in the West, uh, it's fortunes are tied with the Roman empire. And as we all know, the Roman Empire eventually uh, uh, falls and we enter into what we tend to think of as the, the early Middle Ages or sometimes the Dark Ages. Um, but in, in the Western part of the old uh, Roman Empire, uh, Latin becomes the dominant language. And so uh, by the early uh, 400s, uh, a, a Latin translation of the, the Bible, Old and New Testament, is being used in uh, the church, the Orthodox churches of the West, what, what, what we'll come to know as the Roman Catholic Church eventually. Um, and so as these documents are preserved, they're translated into uh, Latin and in some cases other languages, um, the center of preservation uh, goes to these um, monastic communities. Um, uh, there aren't universities yet. It's only in the, what we would think of as the high Middle Ages around uh, 11, 1200 that we begin to see the rise of uh, universities in Europe. Um, the, the key thing to remember here is that in all of these periods, uh, the, the church uh, maintains control of how scripture should be understood uh, and interpreted. Uh, um, the church claims that, that uh, the, the scriptures belong to the church. It's God's gift to the church and only the church can properly uh, read and, and, and interpret it. And, you know, again, the vast, vast majority of Christians in this period are still illiterate and would uh, no, never be able to read these things on their own. Plus, remember, this is still before the printing press. And so uh, 
uh, it would have been a rare community that had an entire New Testament in one volume that, that it could uh, consult. Um, <clears throat> as some of you might know, the Renaissance is a major cultural and intellectual uh, and uh, other, other kinds of forces uh, in, in Europe. Um, and this is kind of prelude to the Protestant Reformation. Uh, there's the famous uh, statue of David by Michelangelo. Um, and there's a, uh, an increased emphasis on humanism, uh, education, science, and the arts uh, begin to flourish. Uh, one of the big um, rallying cries, mottos, you might say, uh, in the Renaissance was uh, the phrase ad fontes, uh, Latin for uh, to the sources. In other words, there was this reappreciation for uh, Greek and Roman uh, uh, writers um, and an increased interest in, in the original languages of the Bible, like Hebrew and Greek. So you, you see a, a kind of new burst of intellectual energy uh, at, at uh, reading these things in their original languages. And this, this is, uh, will have effects on the Protestant Ref Reformation. Um, uh, as we all know, uh, the Protestant Reformation was primarily, uh, or in large measure, a reaction against the authority of the Pope. Well, if the church under the Pope says, we, we control how scripture should be read, we are authoritative, the Protestant reformers had to somehow challenge that. And so folks like Martin Luther or John Calvin said that the authority of the scripture derives from God, not the Pope. And therefore, scripture itself, the Bible itself, represents the will of God, hence it's its own authority. So Luther, I think somewhat naively, but nevertheless uh, transformationally, believed that um, if you put the Bible into the people's languages, they would read the scriptures and understood, understand what it meant and would be able to live the way uh, Luther thought that the, the Bible called for. So Luther's the first to uh, make a serious effort to translate the Bible into the vernacular language. In his case, of course, that was German uh, from the Hebrew and Greek. And this, this coincides, of course, with the invention of the printing press, okay? Um, once, once the printing press is producing things like the Bible, the demand for literacy shoots up. Uh, the literacy rates uh, in this period in Europe go up way beyond anything in human history previously. You know, we, we talk about the revolution caused by the digital age beginning roughly in the 90s, where everyone begins to uh, learn how to use computers and, and, and such. This is a similar kind of transformational period. Um, and, and you know, now with the printing press, the Bible becomes available in a single volume book. It, it, that's just, you know, we, we hold up our, our phones and we've got all of this stuff on them. Uh, being able to hold up a single volume Bible was kind of uh, that revolutionary in its own, own day. Um, after, after the Protestant Reformation is the period of the Enlightenment. Um, that is um, really the uh, 1700s, you know, some beginnings before that, but uh, here's a picture of Isaac Newton. Uh, the Enlightenment is skeptical of traditional wisdom and authority. Uh, scientific ideas had been around, but it's during this time that, that what we would know as the scientific method is uh, developed and a more mechanistic uh, understanding of the universe. Uh, uh, you know, Newton's laws of physics are promulgated in this period. But it's also a period where uh, 
um, what we think of as uh, classic liberal democratic theory. Um, that's uh, um, that uh, John Locke's book there, extremely influential on the, the American and French revolutionary thinkers. Uh, so that you, you begin to see this uh, effort by uh, some Christians, uh, some Christian intellectuals to reposition Christ Christian teaching along what we might call rational lines. And this is the period, honestly, where my discipline, uh, uh, what, what we consider today uh, uh, contemporary biblical criticism or uh, scholarship is born. It's, a, it's an enlightenment product. Um, so while there are pl plenty of very fine scholars uh, who teach in seminaries, uh, teach for the church, um, a lot of a lot of us see ourselves as independent. Um, you know, I I'll, I'll speak personally. I love the church, uh, not just our church, but I love the church and hope that. Uh, uh, hope that I am at least uh, an acceptable, uh, uh, passable Christian. But um, as as a scholar, I see myself as independent. And some of you know, I, I'm not always uh, uh, been able to say, well, uh, uh, the church may think this, but that's not quite what the Bible in this case says. So we tend to see the biblical documents as products of human authors arising out of community concerns or community uh, um, uh, endeavors. Um, and I think the other big thing, in addition to reading them in their original languages, Hebrew and Greek, we read them in terms of their ancient cultures. Um, it's, I guess the older I get, the more difficult it is for me to, to sometimes uh, uh, see how certain old, uh, uh, ancient texts like, let's say, you know, one of Paul's letters quite is relevant for our times. The, the cultural gap is bigger to me now than it, it was when I started this 40 years ago. But that is just kind of uh, the overview and I hope that I've given us enough time for some questions. So I'm gonna look and see what might have been chatted to me. But if you've got a question or comment, please feel free to ask it. Let's see, I'm trying to, uh, I wanna try and catch, I have a, a, a comment, maybe, or a question, sort of. <laughs> I, I'm not sure what it is, but I remember when my uh, father went to Purdue and came back home and said that uh, certain parts of the Bible were allegorical my grandmother um, said, I knew that you'd go away and lose your faith. And somehow, um, I think from what you described, um, for me, there's greater meaning in that, that it, it, what you described as freedom, I think is um, very, very true to my understanding. Um, but I wonder how many people would have my grandmother's response to that, uh, that, that same kind of, uh, um, well, I'm going to stop talking because I think you probably understand what I'm saying um, more than I do. Well, well, thanks, Joan. I, 
Um, you know, when your, your little story of, uh, you know, going, going to way to school and losing your faith, you know, in the college classroom, that's, that's kind of that sense of, of trying to uh, get the Bible to conform to some sort of rational standard, right? And I think one of, there, there, there are still some people in our culture that would dismiss the Bible or stories in the Bible because they aren't, aren't scientific. You know, it, it, if, it, if it's not, if say for example, the story of creation is just a myth, then it can't be true, right? That's kind of the way some people think. But, uh, you know, even if some of these stories aren't meant to be taken scientifically, literally, doesn't mean they, 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 they don't have value. Don't, doesn't mean that they can't speak to the human condition. And that's, that's a sometimes difficult message to get people to hear. And, you know, I think it's, it's uh, uh, part of that legacy of uh, the rationalism of the Enlightenment. You know, you've got, like, think, think of the people just down the road from us, the Creation Museum, right? These people want to insist that the story of creation in the Bible is scientifically accurate. And if it's not, then they would lose their faith because they have bought into that enlightenment notion that the Bible, in order to be true, must be scientifically rational. And I, I, I don't think most biblical scholars today would, would ever go that far. Uh, you recognize that um, there are all kinds of different genres in, in the, the Bible that, uh, that they're not science textbooks and treating them as such is uh, doing them a disservice and doing us a disservice. You, I, you captured it. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm look, feel free to ask other questions, folks. I'm kind of scrolling down through here. I see Alan. I've got a rambling, I've got a rambling it, it, kind of thing here. It's kind of related to that, <laughs> isn't it, Alan? It, yeah, the, what, one of the things that um, I really liked about um, the middle school curriculum about that kind of, you know, started at the beginning of, of the scriptures, um, actually introduced the, the first five books of the, the Bible as campfire stories, which I was like, wow, that's great. We're teaching the middle schoolers the, you know, uh, a good way to look at it. Um, I guess, I, so the question is kind of like, you know, the, an oral tradition is going to come along very differently than a written tradition, which the New Testament is a, is probably a little bit of an amalgamation, but <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't know, but at least, I mean, it has a written component as opposed to the, the stories that started before there was writing had to be, um, had to have all those things like uh, bells and whistles so you remembered the story for one thing and and to draw people in as they're listening and memory devices so that people could actually remember the things that you said. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the things I think about that, this is my, just my, my opinion, is that when, when, um, when people get <clears throat> lit, lit stories, they actually put people in their heads to assess the story and you, you take it away from the heart, which the, the idea of a faith story is to draw your whole self in. You know, you start thinking about now, how in the world can I think of, you know, the creation story as a, you know, all the mental gymnastics taken in your head to try and make that fact-based um, completely distracts from what does this mean to me? Of course, I mean, people circle around to do that, but it really gets people focused in their, in their head instead of sort of a more holistic um, mm -hmm. head and heart. Anyway. Yeah, 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 thanks, Alan. Um, we are almost out of time, and I'm, I'm mindful of, of that. Uh, we'll get into some of these other things uh, coming up. So, for example, uh, Amy asked in chat, how do historians figure out what we know about early Christianity, such as uh, 
when things were written or who was the author. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go along. So, so next week, uh, we're going to look at uh, Mark and Matthew's Gospels, um, and we'll we'll address that that question with them, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about what Alan brought up uh, this oral period. You know, before there was a written story about Jesus, there were stories told word of mouth about Jesus. So we'll talk a little bit about the importance of that process, um, and and. Uh, Hopefully we'll get around to all of your your questions, uh, or at least uh, most of them. Feel free, like I said, to email me. Uh, if you don't have my email, Amy, uh, they, they've got yours. You can pass them along to me. Is that all right with you? Yeah. Okay. And I'll uh, repost, uh, you know, the required reading for next week um, in the newsletter and back on announcements. Um, if you don't get it, <clears throat> let me know. And, and those reading uh, suggestions are, are that suggestions. Uh, if it's more than you want to read, that's okay. If you want to read more than what I've suggested, that's okay too. Well, we should probably say goodbye so we can get ready for to, uh, live stream the, the church service. Um, I want to first thank Amy for uh, making this possible. Amy's been great to work with and her dog didn't bark once while we were uh, doing this and want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, really I'm blown away by how many people were here today. I, Amy and I were thinking, well, if we had 10 people, that'd be worth it. So you folks have uh, really made this worthwhile and uh, thank you for joining us. Please be safe. Pray for the members of our community and uh, for the people trying to make our, our world a better place. Take care. Pox Christie.